Hello, 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 everybody. Good Shabbos, Shabbat Shalom. This is going to be a lot of fun tonight, so settle in, get your popcorn, and if you have any um, little superhero models, bring them together around the TV, around the uh, computer. Before I introduce our wonderful guest, I'd like to take a second to mention that in March 2018, Jacob Jenick, with his sister on the same day, um, for his bar mitzvah, and my wife, my late wife, Renee, was his mentor, did a paper on his role model, Stan Lee. One of Jake's sources and in this paper was Danny Fingeroff, book disguised as Clark Kent, which has a forward by Stan Lee. And the book is right behind me here, and um, he'll talk upon that. Uh, and I found out just a few minutes ago that Jacob is with us tonight, so he gets to meet sort of Stan Lee through um, Danny Fingeroff, and, and hopefully he'll enjoy this and reflect and later on about um, hearing tonight's um, a program. Danny Fingeroff, a popular culture critic and historian with a focus on comics and graphic novels, especially from a Jewish perspective. Tonight, we have an entertaining and informative slideshow presentation on the connection between comics and the Jewish American experience, plus examining Stan Lee. Danny Fingeroth's most recent book, A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, which came out last November, also an audio book read by Danny Fingeroth, and coming out in paperback next month is the, uh, the paperback version. Um, it is the definitive biography of Stan Lee, co-creator of Marvel Comics and its most famous characters, including Spider-Man, uh, the Avengers, and the X-Men. And Danny will have a lot more to go into that. Uh, he's a longtime executive editor and writer at Marvel Comics, where he ran this company's Spider-Man line. Fingeroth, or Danny, is a son of a chazan, a cantor. And I hope we can talk about that somewhere, Danny, uh, somewhere you can squeeze that in. And he's also the author of books, including, as I mentioned, Disguised as Clark Kent, Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero, and was one of the founders of Brooklyn's Jewish Comic-Con. Comic -Con. Now, a note of procedure tonight. We're going to try this a little different than past. Well, Danny is speaking. You can send something in the chat, and I'll take a look at that. And at the end, I'll read some of the questions, and we'll get some answers. And if we're lucky... Um, he'll stick around to schmooze with us uh, after the program. So with that in mind, Danny has spoken on comics related topics at Columbia University, the Smithsonian Institution, the American Jewish Historical Society, the Sherwin Miller Museum of Jewish Art, the Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum, the Society of Illustrators and many other venues. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing him speak to us. And now without a drawing of panel box with dialogue, here, not a bird, not a plane, is <laughs> Danny Finger. Danny, Thank welcome, you. and the the, um, the the screen is yours. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna schmooze a little bit, and then I, I will go into that that uh, slideshow. Uh, thank you. What a Thank you for inviting me. That's a beautiful service. Um, I, I appreciate being referred to as the cultural part of the evening. Uh, my mother would have liked that. And um, I think uh, I did about, about five years ago, I did a, uh, a, a similar talk for your, for your group. Um, is anybody there? Does anybody remember that? Uh, I think it went well. So if you were there, I, no reason not to uh, uh, remind me of it. Anyway, um, these are uh, crazy times and I, and I hope I can entertain and divert you a little bit from the, um, madness that's not going on. I will speak until it's demanded that I shut up because I'm, you know, I have um, the good news and the bad news. I'm in a um, very out of the way setting um, in uh, the Berkshire Mountains, although I usually live in New York, born and, born and raised there on the island of Manhattan. And um, my family is sick of me, so they don't want to talk to me anymore. So I'm yours. Um, until, and you're already home. So it's not like you can say, oh, I got to get home, you're home. But when the, when the boxes start turning black on the screen and I know that everybody signed out, I'll, I'll shut up then. Um, anyway, um, let me, uh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna try to do the, the share screen thing. Um, nope, 
I've already done it wrong. Um, I'm going to take the PowerPoint, then I'm going to do the share screen. Yes, yay. Is my screen being shared? Okay. Uh, it is, you're doing good. And now if I wanna see the, all right. Because I'm not, I'm seeing you guys, but I'm not, I can't get my, let me see, view, um, slideshow. How about now? Perfect. Okay, then I'm gonna have to minimize. All right, hi, okay, so I can't see your faces or hear you, but but as Peter said, please text in questions. And then when I'm through with the presentation, I'm happy to schmooze and turn uh, turn the sound on. Just during the presentation, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate just texting in. Um, why? Okay, I'm screen sharing. There we go. Okay, this is the name of the the name of the talk is disguised as Clark Kent: Jews, Comics, and Superheroes. And um, you can see that um, the metaphor of Superman. It's uh, if you if you haven't um, uh, come across it, it's certainly the idea of Baby Kal El, um, which certainly sounds Hebrew, whether Superman's uh, co-creator, Jerry Siegel, the writer, really meant for it to be Hebrew or just like the sound of uh, growing up that he sounds he heard growing up in Jewish Cleveland remains to be seen. But of course, and there is a rendition of um, Pharaoh's daughter, Finding Moses. So, um, you know, the juxtaposition, these, these, these modern myths, the superheroes certainly have their basis in uh, the ancient uh, myths and religions and stories. Uh, this is my book with its subtle red background, and I just put that picture there to, to burn it into your into your memories. And we'll I'll talk more about it as we get through. But you know, Stanley, as a representative of the generation of uh, people who um, created the most popular superheroes that we know, his is really a a typical story up to a point, and then of course it becomes an untypical story um, demonstrated by the fact that probably he's the comic book creator that you particularly comic book fan. Uh, this is the, you know, the uh, father of all superheroes, Superman. His origin has been told a thousand times in comics, cartoons, movies, um, prose book adaptations, video games. This, this is the first superhero. Um, here's kind of an image that everybody, uh, most people know is Marlon Brando as jor putting him in the uh, baby uh, Kal-El in the uh, rocket ship to send him to Earth. And there is the planet Krypton blowing up and turning into um, um, poison turning into uh, kryptonite, which is deadly to Superman and of course becomes a metaphor for one's past coming back to haunt you. And in the case of the uh, Jewish creators of the superheroes, symbolic possibly of their Jewish backgrounds and of the old country. And speaking of the old country, here are some immigrants uh, arriving uh, in America from, from uh, somewhere in Europe. I, have, you know, I, I don't know if these are Jews or Italians or some other ethnic group, but it's, this was where many of us came from, where, where my ancestors came from. This is the Superman a lot of us of a certain generation grew up with, or even people beyond that generation, because things live forever in reruns. And now on the internet, that's George Reeves as Superman. Um, and in the classic 50s TV show, there is, um, Christopher Reeve, no S, as Superman in the movies of the 70s and 80s. So I think Superman is like a lot of pop culture figures uh, where um, what you think of when you think of the, of the, of the uh, character is the version you grew up with. And this is um, the guy who plays him in the movies now, who's so memorable that I've blanked on his name, but he's the one who's been chosen by DC Comics Little footnote here: If you've been following your your publishing and show business uh, news this year, uh, this week, which there, there I know there are a few other things going on, 
mass restructuring at DC Comics, friends of mine, colleagues of mine laid off. Um, comics, much like, um, uh, much, much like the uh, Yiddish language and much like Jews is, is, has been dying for the past uh, you know, 100 years. Uh, but comic books are still published, even though we know the movie incarnations. These are, are Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Uh, they were school, uh, high school friends in Cleveland, and uh, they co-created Superman. Siegel uh, came up with the idea. They were both born in 1914. Now that's the generation, your parents or you know, your grandparents. And... Um, and uh, they were science fiction fans and science fiction participants in science fiction fandom. Excuse me. And, um, and they had been trying to sell this idea of a character named Superman, called Superman for years and they couldn't. Uh, this is Glenville High School. This is what, where they met and where they went to high school. Um, in, the, in the world of comic books of that era, you know, a lot of those, most of them, most of the people who created the comics uh, didn't go to college. As smart as they were, as creative as they were, um, but most of them were dirt poor or, you know, even if their families had some money, they were just not interested uh, or, 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 you know, in higher education. They wanted, they wanted or needed to get out, many of them from very poor families. That's Glenville High School in, in, in the Glenville neighborhood, which was kind of the uh, the uh, Flatbush Avenue or the, or the Grand Concourse of its day. That's where these guys met. This is Jerry Siegel's house where he grew up, where he and, uh, and Joe Schuster uh, put Superman together. Cleveland is not so great at uh, honoring its cultural heroes. You'll see another one that they only recently honors later in the presentation. This is the house where Jerry Siegel lived, where he and Joe Schuster put Superman together finally um, some people raised funds about uh, 10 or 15 years ago to commemorate the house, um, put plaques on it. But it's very funny. If you ever go to Cleveland, it's just like a house where people live. It's not a museum. It's, uh, you know, I, I had a friend who was a journalist in Cleveland, and I said, how do I get to go to see a Jerry Siegel's house? And he said, well, when you go out there, ring the bell, and if they're home, maybe they'll let you in. You know, <laughs> so, but that is where it happened. Um, they were, so Siegel and Schuster and a lot of people of that generation were fans of early science fiction. And this is, um, this is a pulp magazine. You've either heard of them or seen them. Pulps were um, in all genres. I had a high school teacher who was actually a prolific uh, pulp Western writer uh, named Harold Gluck. But th this is, this was the beginning of science fiction, kind of almost the invention of what was called scientifo fiction or something like that, created by a Jewish immigrant named Hugo Gernsback, uh, who uh, you can see in the upper right under the logo. He's the guy, you know, he was prominent enough. Uh, he went in and out of bankruptcy a number of times, but he kind of put this kind of um, speculative fiction on the map. This is a guy named Max Gaines, also uh, who was born as Max Ginsburg. And he, um, in one of the creation myths, which there are many, invented well, the comic book. Uh, Gaines was a salesman for a, um, a, a printing uh, company. And uh, he figured out that if you took a Sunday newspaper, um, full-size newspaper section and folded it twice, you'd have a magazine that you could sell. Uh, who knows if that story is true, but it's a great story. And Gaines is important um, in, in, in his own uh, as sort of the progenitor of a, uh, of a dynasty of comic book people, although he himself uh, died tragically young in a boating accident. Uh, this, this was the comic that Gaines put together. It's called Famous Funnies. It's, it's, again, officially the first comic book, but you can go back as far as the 1800s or even further back and see things that are like comic books. This guy is not Jewish. This guy is a, as Gentile as you get. This is Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. Uh, but he was the, uh, and he was a very interesting entrepreneurial military um, um, legendary figure. Um, very progressive in, in, in terms of uh, getting uh, African-American soldiers treated equally in the army. His granddaughter is a, 
is kind of trying to correct his place in history. He's been regarded as a buffoon, but um, he actually was very creative and put out what was the first, all well, the comic books that I, the one I showed you before, the famous funnies and, and everything like it was, were reprints of newspaper comics. But when they ran out of newspaper comics, they uh, started out putting out new material. This is the first issue of New Fun. And it actually, they just, the DC Comics uh, has just put out, if you can find it, a, um, an anniversary edition uh, of this comic. Um, and the, it's the size of, of what you would think of maybe the New York Post or the Daily News. That's the size comics were. So this is an, an enormous magazine. Uh, 64 pages, and they put out a very nice uh, version of it. So over here, that's uh, Max Gaines again, and these, uh, that's um, Harry Donenfeld and Jack Leibowitz. They, um, under, under dubious circumstances, though, took over uh, DC Comics uh, from uh, Nicholson, and uh, they formed a partnership with Gaines uh, they sort of had a half interest in, 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 a, in a company that he had, I'll go into more in a minute. And this of course is uh, the first, this was the killer app for superheroes. Superman was the first, what we know as a superhero. Um, I know all the things you've seen in the movies and, and, uh, and on TV, the idea that somebody lifting and smashing a car is not that big a deal, but obviously to that guy in the lower left, it was a big deal. And, um, you know, this, this was the culmination of uh, half a dozen genres of uh, hard-boiled detective fiction and science fiction, even romance, uh, had a political edge. So Superman first appears, this is in, this is in it's cover dated June 1938, so it probably, it's generally thought it came out in April, because comics have traditionally been um, numbered um, a couple of months in advance, uh, and that's Action Comics 1. This is the story, the first Superman story in which he really is a, uh, dare I say, a social justice warrior in which uh, this is, uh, he's taking a corrupt senator and, or a guy corrupting a senator and uh, showing him the error of his ways. In the same story, he confronts uh, a guy who's abusing his wife and a slumlord. And a few years later, in actually in Look Magazine, uh, Superman is confronting uh, the, uh, the ultimate supervillain, Adolf Hitler. He also confronts Stalin in this story. So Siegel and Schuster, and, and, and Superman was the first character to really have a brand of uh, radio show, a radio show with Bob Collier, and then a cartoon by the Fleischer Brothers studio where, uh, where a lot of future uh, well-known comic book creators broke in. But this really, you know, Superman was the first superhero and one of the first big merchandising characters, although merchandising uh, goes back as far as the Yellow Kid in the 1890s and Buster Brown. So Siegel and Schuster had sort of a tragic story. They came up with Superman, but they did it as what was called work for hire. Um, some of you or many of you may be familiar. They didn't, they never owned the character. They made good money for a few years, but ultimately uh, they, there were lawsuits and bad feelings and the owner, I mean, uh, you know, was, was the, what called it was DC Comics and now it's come down to be Warner's, which is owned by, uh, by AT&T. Um, and so Siegel and Schuster were kind of back out on their own and they tried to catch lightning in a bottle a second time including with this character called Funny Man, who was sort of modeled on uh, the uh, comedian and, ra and uh, TV uh, and movie star, Danny Kaye. Uh, if you never heard of Funny Man, you're not alone. Most people never heard of Funny Man. Um, but, um, you know, so, so Siegel and Schuster had ups and downs, a lot of downs and ended up nearly destitute until the, until the 1970s on the eve of the Superman movie when a couple of, uh, of, 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 of um, influential comic book creators got them a pension and their credits back. Um, the, one of the other big schools in the, uh, in, the, in the various high schools that were the Princeton, Harvard, and Yale of comics, this is DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. It's still there. Uh, this is their new building. I think it was built in 1929 or so. 
a lot of famous people, a lot of famous uh, boys, mostly because it was a boys' school uh, from the Bronx, uh, went there. This was in the North Bronx on uh, near Marshallu Parkway. Um, this is Stan Lee, and that stands a uh, high school graduation picture. He went there, uh, and you know I'll get back uh, more to him. But he was active in the uh, in the school literary magazine. But these two on the left is a guy named Bob Kane, born Robert Kahn, and uh, Bill Finger is on the right. Uh, no relation to me, as far as far as I know. And they came up with this character. Uh, they they were uh, they were Bronx uh, Jewish kids lived. Um, Kane, um, Kane's family was a little more well-to-do. His family lived on the Grand Concourse. Um, Finger uh, did not, but they both were DeWitt Clinton alumni. And uh, together they came up with Batman, although it took many years for, for Finger to get to his share of credit. Bob Kane uh, was um, for many years considered the only creator. Uh, but you know, this is, this is Batman. This besides Superman, he's the, and maybe Spider-Man, the superhero most people know. That, so Superman was a big hit, um, which led to Batman um, because DC wanted to, obviously every publisher and anybody who could hold a pencil wanted to recreate that success. So uh, there were characters like Hawkman, the Green Lantern and the Flash in Flash comics. Um, pretty much all of them created uh, by um, Jewish, kid, Jewish uh, guys, sons of immigrants uh, from, they came from all the five boroughs. They were from Brooklyn, the Bronx. Uh, I don't know if any were from Staten Island from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And uh, there was this incredible phenomenon of superheroes where these teenage kids or these guys in their early twenties were out earning their fathers. Uh, Wonder Woman, uh, not Jewish as far, uh, although you'll, you'll know where I'm going with this probably, but Wonder Woman was created, uh, and there's uh, Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, was created in uh, 1941 um, by um, William Moulton Marston, who's the guy on the left, who was a uh, idiosyncratic psychiatrist who had actually, he was sort of like the Dr. Phil or one of those uh, TV psychiatrists of his, uh, of that era. and. Um, he had started out attacking comics. And so uh, Max Gaines on the right there, who was running this sort of, um, this uh, uh, kind of a sister company of DC Comics called All American Comics, uh, owned the company. And um, so, so um, Marston on the left and, a, and an artist named uh, Harry Peter, who was actually, um, you can see these guys are older than like the teenagers creating the other superheroes. These were more experienced um, people more experienced in life, but Sheldon Mayer, uh, the guy uh, in the middle wearing the jacket was the editor and he was one of the people who discovered Superman sitting in a slush pile, not the, not the, not the character, the, 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 <laughs> the script and art for Superman. And uh, so this is a kind of the brain trust of, um, of Wonder Woman. So although, um, Although Wonder Woman doesn't have a particularly Jewish background, her, some of her creators and some of the people behind the scenes did. Uh, Gaines um, wanted to do, go on to do uh, different and uh, bigger things. He was restless. I'm not sure how he got along with uh, Donna Feld and Leibovitz, but they did buy him out. And he went on to form a company called um, Educational Comics. That's EC, remember those initials? Some of you already know those initials. Um, and he wanted to do things like picture stories from the Bible, from creation to Judah Maccabee. Um, and so this goes back uh, to the early 40s and he saw, he saw a market and he saw a way for comics to, you know, to gain a little more respectability and another way uh, to uh, generate revenue. So, so that, that was sort of the DC comic side. This guy who was actually not that old in this picture, but he had white hair was named Martin Goodman. And he was the founder of, uh, of Timely uh, Comics, which was part of a larger magazine empire he owned, although he like the other, he was also uh, the child of immigrants born uh, in Brooklyn, um, kind, of did, kind of brought himself up by his bootstraps. 
um, rode the rails with hobos to kind of learn what life was like. And he, he was the publisher of, of, as you can see, his comics, including Captain America. The first Marvel, Marvel had been a publisher of pulp magazines like the ones that you saw that Astounding Tales. And, uh, and when Superman and Batman started becoming popular, Goodman, every publisher, but Goodman in particular, wanted to get in on that action. And he hired a packaging company, which means a company that um, would deliver a finished comic book. And, uh, and they, and they uh, did a, a bunch of comics for him. And the first Marvel comic was called Marvel Comics. And it introduced the Human Torch and the Submariner, um, the, the Angel, um, Became a different character, but those are those are the most famous ones, and that's a uh, a, a cover by a guy named uh, Frank R. Paul, who was a prolific pulp uh, cover artist. Um, after a couple of after a short time, Goodman's comics were very successful, and uh, he hired um, in-house staff as well as freelancers to supplement the material provided by Funny Zinc, and that was. Um, and he hired Joe Simon on the right, who was a young Jewish guy from upstate New York, who he had been a sports cartoonist to be the editor and, uh, and a guy named Jack Kirby, who was born Jacob Kurtzberg in Brooklyn to be the art director. And among the many characters these two created together and with other collaborators and on their own was Captain America. Uh, this, this is the first issue of Captain America. It came out in December of 1940 a full year before Pearl Harbor. But here were Simon and Kirby advocating pretty uh, directly for uh, America to enter uh, you know, the war, uh, World War II, uh, you know, on the side of the allies and against uh, Hitler and the Nazis and the Axis, which was, uh, you, know, you would think it was an extremely popular thing and it was, but uh, there was strong anti-war sentiment. There was strong anti-Semitic sentiment. There were, um, American Nazis um, were, were uh, picketing the, um, the building, the McGraw Hill building where Timely had its offices and death threats were phoned in. Uh, Mayor LaGuardia sent uh, police to, uh, to guard the office and to guard Simon and Kirby. This is Captain America's origin. If, if, uh, you know, if you've seen the movies, you've seen a version of it. And that is uh, even in 1940, uh, Albert Einstein, was an iconic enough character that they could make a scientist giving uh, young Steve Rogers the super soldier formula uh, to make, make him look enough like Einstein. As the years went on, when they'd recount the origin, he looked pretty much exactly like Einstein. Uh, and Captain America was the first Marvel brand extension. Um, so that was the, a Republic serial uh, from the uh, 40s. Uh, featuring Captain America, not especially Jewish, nor is, nor is Chris Evans, however, who plays Captain America in the movies. But as we'll see, there are certain there's Jewish roots to Captain America. This is Stan Lee at about, uh, I guess he's probably in his early 20s, looks like he's in the army, but Stan was Martin Goodman's wife's cousin. Um, and uh, he was a teenager, he graduated to Whit Clinton High School. In, the, uh, in June of 39, he had had a bunch of odd jobs that included um, uh, writing obituaries, which he found very depressing, uh, working in the uh, garment district as, a, uh, as an errand boy, uh, working in a, in, in, in a movie theater in, uh, the, in, in Midtown Manhattan, where he uh, once uh, tripped, uh, tripped and embarrassed himself while showing Eleanor Roosevelt to a seat. So Stan comes in as an all-round assistant, a gopher, um, and um, he uh, had aspirations to be a writer. He was about uh, 17, 18 years old. And um, they, they needed a certain amount of text in comic books to qualify for a discount on shipping. So every comic had uh, two or three pages uh, that they assumed that no actual kid read. And so this was Stan's uh, first printed uh, work was a, a short story illustrated by Jack Kirby. So really the first uh, team up of Lee and Kirby. And uh, Stan's name, Stan was born uh, Stanley Martin Lieber, which you know, not, not an especially ethnic name, but he, I think partly he felt uh, 
it was too Jewish. And I think he always said he was saving his name, his full name for writing for the novels he would write that he never actually wrote. Stanley is kind of a dopey name. You know, you take the name Stanley, divide it in half. Uh, many people thought he was Asian. Um, uh, when you say, even to this day, when I say to people, I've written a book about Stanley, they go, Stanley who? And I go, no, no, Stanley. But you know, when you're 17 years old and you think it's a job you'll have for two months and move on to the next thing, that's the kind of name you give yourself. This is Stan as a uh, child in Washington Heights, which was a very Jewish neighborhood uh, then. And uh, there's still some remnants of it, but he had on a bicycle uh, that was kind of his gateway to freedom from being kind of confined in, uh, in the streets of New York to be able to go all the way to New Jersey. And uh, this is uh, what's now a church, but had been the Hebrew tabernacle of Washington Heights. And it's where Stanley had his bar mitzvah, which according to him was attended by about 12 people. I did, um, we can talk later. I did, um, uh, although Stan, although the biography is not technically, if not, it's not authorized period, I did do two lengthy interviews with Stan for it about a year before he died. Uh, Stan would go on to co-create characters like the destroyer, um, and Jack Frost, and, and uh, you know, you can see the enemy, the, the enemies are Nazis during the war. They made a logical um, bad guys uh, in real life and in comics. And, uh, and, and so Stan uh, very early on was doing a lot of writing. And then, uh, and then when Simon and Kirby left the company um, under a dispute with, uh, with Goodman, oddly enough, over royalties and uh, and participation in Captain America. Um, Stan was in place as a temporary editor, but he stayed with the company for another uh, 60 or 70 years. So as I used to joke, they never found a real grown up to take the job he, and essentially became the editor. Um, in another sector, uh, back in the newspaper comics and another DeWitt Clinton graduate was a guy named Will Eisner. Eisner was kind of a cartoonist cartoonist and he created this character called the Spirit uh, which was almost an anti-superhero. It was a very film noir kind of uh, story. And it was not, it would appear later in comics, but it, it was the result of a newspaper syndicate wanting to get in on this superhero business and this comic book business. So they hired Eisner, who was known for being very creative and very dependable, um, to create a comic book that would be inserted into Sunday newspapers if anybody remembers sort of those TV guide kind of sections, that's what, what, what came to be called the spirit section. And the spirit was known for having its very um, dynamic kind of uh, cover, covers, which were also the first pages of the story. And Eisner was always very creative with his layouts. And there was a fair amount of Jewish and Yiddish content. Uh, he has a character supposedly Irish, but his name is Slim Mazel as in the expression schlamazel, or you know, the, the, the one who has the soup spilled on him. And Eisner was, was constantly filling his stories with uh, allusions uh, to uh, Jewish uh, culture, New York culture. And, you know, and uh, Eisner was an innovator both in the 30s and 40s, and we'll see later on and how the kind of turn his work took. This is Jules Pfeiffer, whose work you may know, of course, from his Pfeiffer comic strip. Uh, also from his many children's books and screenplays. Um, and he's still, he is still at age 91. He's still very active and very productive. And we'll see that Pfeiffer started out as Eisner's assistant. And together they did a lot of work. I, I just noticed that Jules has two pens in his pocket there. So that's sort of the ultimate nerd emblem. That's great. <laughs> um, uh, Eisner and, uh, and Pfeiffer uh, worked uh, together um, on, on a lot of stories and they, when Jules worked on them, they often had a very kind of New York Jewish smart aleck um, um, skeptical point of view. This is a story called 10 Minutes. And uh, of course the premise is, well, what's 10 minutes in a man's life? And of course it's the most important 10 minutes ever. Um, and this one is set in, uh, a um, New York tenement. Uh, you get you get the sense that this uh, kid Freddie, who uh, is morose, is um, 
although he's drawn with kind of a button, you know, a stereotypical Irish nose, he ends up in big trouble uh, with a local candy store owner. Uh, and the milieu of this and many of the stories that, that Pfeiffer did with Eisner was quite Jewish. This you may recognize as City College in Manhattan. It was also the first home of the High School of Music and Art. Uh, and um, these uh, erudite, uh, highly intellectual gentlemen here were students there. Uh, on the left is Al Jaffe, um, who uh, became, who was one of Mad Magazine's main artists. And on uh, the right is his friend, Wolf Eisenberg, who was Will Elder, was another of the classic mad artists. Al is still alive at 99 and uh, just retired. <laughs> he just decided he was gonna stop drawing. I think he outlasted Mad. Mad was actually more or less canceled except for reprints recently. And I guess, uh, so Al actually outlasted the magazine. This is them in the cafeteria at Music and Art. There's a guy named Harvey Kurtzman also went to Music and Art. Uh, he, uh, I think he had more hair when he was a high school student, but together they and John Severin and John's sister Marie and um, a few other people formed the nucleus of what beca would become Mad Magazine. Uh, and Mad was famous and still is famous for bringing a arguably Jewish attitude, a kind of outsider, smart ass, Yiddish inflected um, humor uh, towards things, uh, towards their point of view, including a uh, story called Yanis, which I, 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 you know, which is Yiddish for thieves, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I doubt whether most of the audience got the uh, joke of Ganesh. The uh, art, and especially in, in this one, is very busy with all sorts of background detail. And uh, Elder used to call, uh, used to call that the chicken fat. Um, another, another, um, Mad did, Mad did spoofs of other comic books and of, and of, movie, and of movies. And here's their Bat Boy and Ruben. Um, again, uh, you have heard of these two masked bat-like crime fighters of Gotham City. This story has absolutely nothing to do with them. Um, this is a lampoon. If you want to spend your dime on cheap rotten lampoons like this instead of the ever-loving genuine real thing, go right ahead, boy. Um, again, is this Jewish? Is, are people wearing uh, talus and the tefillin? No, but there's, you know, it, 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 it brought a certain kind of humor that, that felt like it came off the streets of the Lower East Side or the streets of the Bronx. Um, remember Max Gaines from before? This is his son, uh, William Gaines on the left and Al Feldstein on the right. Um, and uh, and uh, Gaines uh, Jr became the publisher of Mad when his father died in a horrific boating accident in the Adirondacks. He wanted to be a high school chemistry teacher, had no interest in going into publishing, but his Jewish mother it kind of guilted him into it. And if he was gonna do it, he was gonna do it his way. So under his reign, educational comics became entertaining comics. And he and Felstein put out uh, the famous EC horror comics of the 50s, which were done by some of the best writers and artists, often had strong pro-social, uh, anti-bigotry, anti-anti-Semitic um, storylines. Well, they had plenty of gratuitous gore and sex as well. Uh, and they were so popular, they were investigated by the Senate. A guy named uh, this, this gentleman, Frederick Wortham, uh, was a uh, emigre Jewish psychiatrist from Austria who um, opened a free, um, a free psychiatric clinic, the first one in Harlem, um, to serve uh, poor and minority uh, children and adults. And uh, he was a big enemy of comics. He thought that comics uh, were kind of uh, debased um, the human experience and uh, made children to juvenile delinquents. And he was part of the big, um, decline in comics of the 50s. Many of the other critics of comics were coming more from a right-wing sort of Christian perspective. Wortham was a progressive uh, Jewish uh, psychiatrist. Um, and uh, he also was a big publicity hound, again, like a Dr. Phil or, or someone like that. Um, eventually, 
the EC comics were canceled and they, uh, the horror comics were canceled. They tried to revive themselves with uh, higher class things like psychoanalysis. Because what kid could uh, resist a comic about psychoanalysis? Um, that, as you would imagine, didn't do all that well, but you can see it says introducing a new direction in magazines. And that resulted um, in this kind of brief heyday <coughs> post horror of EC. Um, and maybe one of the most famous and uh, most groundbreaking comic book stories ever is called Master Race, by, uh, written by Feldstein, but drawn uh, by an artist named Bernard Kriegstein. <coughs> and Kriegstein, if, if you can sort of see, took his took uh, a cue from modern art and and uh, and and from some and the artists of the fifties. This really, you know, he precedes precedes Warhol and and uh, and Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein. Uh, it's a story, and it's the first story that really ever mentioned, uh, even alluded to the Holocaust. Um, it's about a Holocaust, uh, a, a prisoner in a, in, a, in a concentration camp who meets, meets up with the commandant and it's got an O'Henry twist ending. Uh, but that was a very groundbreaking story. But eventually EC went on uh, to make Mad into a black and white magazine. And that freed it from what was called the Comics Code, which was sort of the self-censorship bureau of the comics business. And so people and Mad became Mad, which the, the magazine that everybody knows, it was just canceled. Uh, this is the Mad Fold-In, which was done by Al Jaffe, who we saw in high school a little while ago. Al did this as a one-off um, and said, uh, okay, I got that out of my system, but then it was so popular that he ended up doing over, over a period of, um, of about 50 years, um, I think about 500 of them. Al, in his old age, somehow, even though he's uh, basically an atheist, uh, although very Jewish identified, he had an incredible, Jew he spent a lot of his, uh, I can talk more later if you want about his life growing up and running around the countryside in Lithuania in the shtetl. Uh, in recent years, Al was doing something called the Spy for the, um, for the Lubavitch uh, magazine. And uh, here's Al and Mordecai Kaplan. For the three people in the audience who will get the visual joke, that's what Al looks like now. And there's the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism, Mordecai Kaplan, um, I'll move on. Uh, here were some Jewish kids in the Bronx. This was in 1939, the Science Fiction Club. They had convened for the 1939 World's Fair. Um, and of course, being uh, New Yorkers and Jews and uh, socially aware, there was a schism so I think there were two conventions that year because one convention wouldn't talk to the other one. Um, second from the left is a guy named Julius Schwartz. On the right is Mort Weisinger. I think there are the other people, I think as a, a guy named Jack Anderson, these are very famous, went on to become famous science fiction writers. Uh, Schwartz though became the editor of Superman comics. He uh, trained for it. He'd been a, an agent for science fiction writers. He trained for it um, literally on the train, on the subway down from the Bronx to his interview was the first comic books he read allegedly. That's truly as a old man, he passed away maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but he was one of the main movers and shakers at DC Comics. Uh, the superheroes kind of lost their popularity in the late forties. And uh, then there were those other genres we saw like the horror, the EC comics. Uh, in the fifties though, Julie and, uh, and some other uh, comics were in trouble because of that guy Wortham, because of television, which, you know, kids were flocking to in droves. Um, and they decided to uh, take a chance and bring back versions of superheroes in the 40s. Julie was the editor uh, of this and a guy named Bob Kaniger was the writer. So suddenly there's a modern sleeker look to superheroes. It was the era of psychoanalysis uh, where there were movies from Hollywood uh, uh, that were more, more than that, that were went a little more psychological depth. Uh, shows like um, Naked City um, that that were kind of uh, psychologically oriented. So suddenly, Superman, who had spent most of the first twenty years of his career not even thinking about being from Krypton, suddenly he's 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 aware of it. There are stories about it, and really, there's an interpretation of this which I think is valid of 
kind of uh, immigrant Jewish uh, writers and artists, uh, although of course there were people from all ethnic groups, but it, it was a largely Jewish business looking back at the old country, looking back uh, with some guilt uh, on the Holocaust. The Superman preserves the, the city of Kandor, kind of like him taking a piece of the Kryptonian shtetl and keeping it in his fortress of solitude. Uh, the heroes banded together the, uh, you know, both Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, who'd been continually published and the revival characters and into a group called the Justice League, which was very popular. And uh, that led Stan Lee's boss, here's Stan in the 50s, that led Martin Goodman and Stan Lee and Jack Kirby to come up. And they, they had been putting out sort of schlocky genre comics that nobody uh, was really that you know, they sold well enough. They had no real brand identity. They did stuff like Groot, who you may know from the uh, Marvel movies from the Guardians of the Galaxy. Groot was a little different character. I don't think Groot was Jewish. I, I never asked. Um, but that's the kind of thing they were doing. And this is Jack Kirby, who um, had been bouncing around the industry, regarded as a genius, but also as sort of somebody a little bit hard to work with. And he and Kirby came up with the Fantastic Four, really as a... Uh, an attempt to imitate the success of, uh, of the Justice League. Uh, they were in a real New York, you know, they were, they were in, based in New York City and uh, they were identifiably, identifiably Jewish types walking around. There were stories about characters called the Inhumans who were kind of lived in a self-imposed ghetto and they kept to themselves and didn't, you know, they, they were forbidden to intermarry with regular humans. You know, I think this is informed uh, in part by the Jewish backgrounds of the creators. The hate monger was a character they fought who turned out to be a spoiler alert. I know it's only 60 years later, but the hate monger turned out to be Hitler under the mask. And obviously he was modeled after a Ku Klux Klan um, uh, costume and was that kind of a, uh, a character that's all too familiar. Uh, currently of somebody who loves to fan the flames of hate for their own purposes. Spider-Man was a character created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Ditko was not Jewish. He was um, from you know, middle, you know, middle European origins. Uh, he's maybe Jewish just by kind of association, living in New York in a very real New York with New York types. Oddly enough, the you know, the, the earliest the Jewish kind of connections I found in the early Marvels done by uh, Stan and his collaborators was Captain America suffering from uh, survivor's guilt from frozen in iceberg uh, at the end of World War II. Um, I, uh, who am I? For a moment, I had almost forgotten myself, but I am not lucky enough to forget forever, to forget that I was once the man the world called Captain America. So he lost his partner, Bucky, and his girlfriend, and he, he, for a long time, and in the movies too, he just walks around feeling guilty about surviving. The Norse god Thor, for years, wanted to marry a mortal woman, his uh, uh, Jane Foster, and here he is uh, confronting his father in an early story. My heart is torn with love. I crave permission to marry a mortal girl. Have you taken leave of your senses? Uh, the god of thunder marrying a mortal is impossible. Petition refused. Um, you know, the story itself and the follow-up where Jane Foster converts and gets superpowers and is a disaster, I think really could only have been created by Lee and Kirby or uh, this is uh, Chris Hemsworth as Thor in the, in the Marvel movies. Uh, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, which was sort of a World War II super type of super team, were uh, in a con or fought their way out of a concentration camp. I know not that realistic, but they did it. Um, Marvel had a character, has a character called the Sabra, uh, an Israeli superhero who fought the Hulk and others. Magneto, or Magneto, uh, your choice, was the X Men's main villain for many years. Uh, in the 80s, it was revealed that he had been in uh, Auschwitz. Uh, Marvel danced around whether he was Jewish or Gypsy um, uh, for years until recently, maybe in the past 10 years, they did 
declare that he indeed was Jewish besides being an evil mutant. It was tricky because he was like the world's most lethal and uh, antisocial supervillain because he had been persecuted. And that was a hot potato that, that uh, Marvel uh, was loath to deal with. Uh, this is a X-Men story um, set in a dystopian future where mutants, which, was, which is Marvel's symbol for any minority group, whether it be uh, gay or black or Jewish or, um, you know, or mutants, uh, but mutants were the metaphor. And uh, this was called Days of Future Past, which became a movie uh, with, uh, with um, Ian McKellen as Magneto and, um, and, the, and uh, I'm blanking on the uh, name of the guy who played him as a younger man, but this was, you know, these were all based on uh, the whole uh, mut Jew as mutant, mutant as Jew, persecuted minority, uh, outsider. Jack Kirby in the 70s went over to DC Comics and uh, Jack was very conscious of being Jewish, even though he had changed his name to Kirby. Um, and he did, uh, one of the things he did there was a character, was a group of characters called the Forever People, which kind of always struck me as kind of a, kind of a, a code name for, for Jews. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if Jews are not the forever people who are. This is a uh, Hanukkah card that Kirby drew with the Fantastic Four character, The Thing. Um, people took from this um, the, uh, that Kirby meant for The Thing to be Jewish. And so about 20 years ago, so it's really canon, they established him as Jewish. They had him have a bar mitzvah. Uh, and you're really Jewish? There a problem with that? No, it's just, you don't look Jewish. Um, so in, in modern times, you know, characters no longer have to be coded as, you know, a metaphor. Mutants, you don't, you don't have to have, just have mutants standing in for Jews. People can be Jews, people can be gay, people can be black. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm winding it up. So if you're getting restless, we're getting near the end. Um, but there's a character called Kitty Pride, who was one of the X-Men who uh, wore, wears a Jewish star. Uh, comics are more, um, oddly enough, they're more explicitly ethnic um, and, uh, and, and depict, you know, represent the world around us. Um, I think the percentage of Jews actually producing the comics is fewer. This is the golem from the silent movie based on the golem myth. A lot of people think Superman uh, is an inspired the golem. I think it's possible. I don't think, I don't think it was as major as some people do. Marvel actually did a golem comic in the 70s. Um, James Sturm, who was an educator and artist, did a story about it, the golem joining a, a traveling barnstorming baseball team. Robert Crumb, who's not Jewish, but it was Jewish obsessed uh, in the, the underground era, uh, had a character called Lenore, Lenore Goldberg and her girl commandos. Um, it's Crumb, so um, I, you, you probably have your own opinion about Crumb already. So um, he did do the Bible, the book of Genesis illustrated the first book of the Bible graphically depicted, nothing left out. Um, and it's, uh, it's worth reading. I mean, again, uh, Crumb is, is not to everybody's taste, although he's pretty popular. I like that in the Bible, there were uh, uh, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who I guess because Shem sounded enough like Shem, uh, Crumb drew them as Shem, Larry, and Mo of the Three Stooges, also an acquired taste, but there you have it. This is Harvey Picar. Um, some of you, if you don't know his comics, may remember him as like the weird guy in the David Letterman show in the 80s. Harvey, like Siegel and Schuster, was from Cleveland, uh, and he sort of was a second generation underground innovator. Um, and had a lot of Jewish content in his stories. This was something he did with Crumb uh, called Standing Behind Old Jewish Ladies in Supermarket Lines. Not really a superhero comic, but we're going far afield here. And uh, in the American Splendor movie, which was, uh, that was Picar's uh, overall title for his body of work. This is um, Paul Giamatti as Harvey acting out that, uh, that comic. So over the years, there have been many spoofs of superheroes uh, or homages uh, or Jewish versions. This one is The Legend of Shalom Man by uh, Al uh, Wiesner. Uh, there's probably a hundred issues of Shalom Man. I think that cover kind of gives you the idea. This is, remember young Will Eisner we saw a while ago? This was old Will Eisner, probably in the 90s or around 2000. He died in 2005. Eisner 
uh, reinvented himself and the medium in the late 70s with a graphic novel called A Contract with God. Eisner um, was not the first to use the term graphic novel, but he really put it into popular usage. And he wanted to be the Saul Bellow or Philip Roth of comics. He really believed comics could be art and literature. And uh, so this is a story about a Orthodox Jew whose daughter dies as a teenager. And uh, even though he believed that as, a, that as a child, he had made a contract with God that nothing bad would ever befall him. It turned out that this was very autobiographical. Uh, that Eisner himself had lost uh, a daughter as a teenager, but nobody outside his family and closest friends knew it. Um, so Contract with God was um, really four short novellas, including this one called Kuchelein, which was about, uh, also autobiographical. This is the Bronx of the 30s. And it was about Eisner's coming of age uh, in, the, in the Catskills Mountain Resort. He spent, uh, so this was in, the late 70s, he lived another 25 years and produced a, an enormous body of work. There was a, so the Oscars of the comics called the Eisner Awards were named after him. For a period, you could get an Eisner Award from Will Eisner. Um, and he was very concerned with Jewish uh, matters and subject matter, including the resurgence of the uh, protocols of the elders of Zion. And he did a graphic novel, uh, which was his effort to debunk it and to show it for the uh, fraud that it was. Eisner uh, inspired a lot of people, a lot of young cartoonists um, at, who sort of were, came out of the underground. The best known of them is Art Spiegelman who did Mouse uh, about his father's experiences in, in Auschwitz. Um, an artist best known for, Jewish best known for um, superhero and war comics. Joe Kubert did something called Yussel, an imagined uh, alternate life for himself. What if his family had not um, had not had not left um, had not left Eastern Europe and immigrated to America? He did a story <coughs> about um, sort of the choices he had to make as a young man about whether to go into crime or art. And called other recent uh, Jewish themed graphic novels, The Property by Rutu Modan about a young woman who goes with her grandmother back to Poland to uh, try to reclaim the property that was stolen from them during the Holocaust. Um, a book recently came out that I recommend called We Spoke Out, Comic Books and the Holocaust. Um, uh, introduction by Stan and it's, it's about comics that uh, dealt with the Holocaust and World War II. Um, edited by Neil Adams, Raphael Madoff, and Craig Yo. Jules Pfeiffer, of course, who went on to be Jules Pfeiffer, um, just recently completed, completed a trilogy of graphic novels. This is the third one called The Gross Script, very much Pfeifferian, but very much also an homage to his mentor, uh, Eisner, and very Jewish. The, these three books are very much uh, involved with uh, being Jewish and, and, and uh, life in New York and Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. Uh, Wonder Woman didn't become Jewish, but she is now played by Gal Gadot, who is an Israeli actress, so things come full circle. Stan Lee um, moved back to uh, Washington Heights, uh, but he did do a, one of his famous cameos in a recent, in one of the last Marvel movies where he played a, uh, a uh, kind of grouchy old man. Um, here he is playing another. Stan was very good at playing uh, yeah, old men, either grouchy or with advice or being very funny. Here he is with in one of the Spider-Man movies. This is my earlier book that um, that Peter mentioned, disguised as Clark Kent. It's out of print, but I think you can still find it. That's my wife's family coming off of the uh, off of the boat at Ellis Island uh, into this uh, into America, which uh, and then uh, an artist named Mark Bay who was kind enough to draw that great superhero in the background. Uh, that is my book again, in case you forgot that I'd written a book about Stan Lee. And this is uh, my website, the best ways to find me.